get ready to blast off into the incredible world of brain-computer interfaces. Neuro careers doing the impossible is taking you on a journey to meet the fearless pioneers pushing the boundaries of what's possible. In this special series, we'll be shining a spotlight on the nominees and winners of the International BCI Award, one of the biggest and most prestigious awards in the BCI world. You'll hear from BCI professionals as they share their revolutionary work and get a behind-the-scenes sneak peek at what it takes to be a winner. So, buckle up, grab a snack, and get ready to be amazed as we explore the impossible becoming a reality in the world of BCIs. But before we blast off, I want to give a big thanks to the co-host of this BCI Award edition on our podcast, Dr. Christoph Guger and GTEC Medical Engineering. When I was a faculty member at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, my team and I did some pretty amazing stuff for patients needing epilepsy surgery. We would put special sensors, also called grids, directly on their brain to prepare for surgery and create maps of their brain in a much faster and safer way than is usually done. It's called high gamma mapping, and it lets us figure out in just a few minutes the essential parts of the brain that need to be spared during surgery. Can you imagine? You can create a map of language, motor, and even mass processing in no time. It was the first time this innovative technology was used at Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. When I moved to Florida, I established the first functional brain mapping and BCI program at Florida Hospital. I continue to use high gamma mapping to help epilepsy patients avoid losing their ability to speak or move after surgery. But even cooler than that, I created brain-computer interface studies that let patients control things with their brain in real time. Our patients could even spell words with incredible speed by just using their brains. No hands involved. I also discovered that brain-computer interfaces could help patients move their chronically impaired hands or legs years after a stroke when not much else could help them. So, I started working with the faculty from Advent Health University to help these patients restore their ability to use their hands. I received special training for it, and it's still mind-blowing how cool it is. My favorite part of what I do is teaching. At my established Institute of Neuro Approaches, I've integrated all my experience and knowledge into a unique course on brain-computer interfaces. With graduate neurobiology students, we started with theory, and then I gave them the BCI equipment so they could have hands-on experience working with BCIs. It significantly improved the way students learn, and they absolutely love this practical part of learning how to use neurotechnology. And all of this was made possible thanks to GTEC's awesome brain-computer interface technology. They have everything from high-tech up to 1,024-channel EEG systems to wearables, tools for neurorehabilitation, 
such as the medical grade system recoveries and educational kits for the unicorn hybrid block for learning how to work with BCI technology. But the most important part is their support and care. I have enjoyed working and collaborating with Dr. Christoph Guger and GTEC employees for over 15 years, and I hope for many more successful years ahead. So, if you are interested in GTEC's brain computer interfaces and neurotechnologies, check out their website at gtech.net. It's worth it. And keep in mind, I do not receive any financial support from GTEC and share my honest opinion, supported by many years of experience working with their equipment. Dear NeuroCareers podcast listeners, welcome back to our special BCI Award NeuroCareers podcast series, where we interview nominees and winners of the International Annual BCI Award. Today, we are thrilled to have with us Dr. Lazar Jovanovic, a scientist and entrepreneur with a passion for human-machine interfacing and wearable technology for health and wellness applications. Dr. Jovanovic recently completed his PhD at the Institute of Biomedical Engineering at the University of Toronto, where his research on brain-computer interface-controlled stimulation therapy earned him the first place award in the human health category at the University of Engineering Research Conference. Dr. Jovanovic's entrepreneurial spirit has led him to develop Summations, a platform that aims to enhance a reader's understanding of academic articles. Dr. Jovanovic's project, Kite BCI, Brain Computer Interface System for Functional Electrical Stimulation Therapy, was nominated for the International Annual BCI Award in 2021. In this episode, he will share his career journey experience with successful BCI award submission and give valuable advice on career development in neurotech. Join us as we learn from his journey and explore the exciting world of neurotechnology. Welcome, Dr. Jovanovic. It's a pleasure to have you on our podcast today. Can you tell us about your background and what inspired you to pursue a career in biomedical engineering and focus on brain-computer interfaces? Actually, before you tell us about that, can you tell us where you are joining us from and some interesting fact about the place where you work or you study? Anything interesting you can tell us? Of course. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to share my journey with you and uh, your audience. Today I'm joining from near Vancouver, Canada, so on the west coast of Canada. I moved here last year in the summer of 2022. So I continue to work on my company summations remotely. And I have also in the meantime started my postdoctoral research here at the Simon Fraser University. Uh, So that's what I'm doing right now, Uh, and I'm doing research in this space of biomechanics, still related to the human body, just slightly different from biomedical engineering work, which I did during my PhD. An interesting fact about this place here, especially San Francisco University, is that their main campus is on a mountain, so it's really nice to uh, actually go to that campus. It's going up on a mountain. There's a small neighborhood besides the campus. And the campus, and that's all that's on the mountain. And the whole mountain is kind of this academic university environment. And I quite enjoy going to work there because on clear days, there are many beautiful views that can be seen from the mountain, either looking north towards the mountains, looking south towards the city from that high distance. So that's the, the fun fact I would share about this place here. 
Yeah. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. Yeah, it felt that I was there, you know, on the mining uh, and looking. Yeah. And it's a very good environment actually to think. So for academia, I think that's a perfect place. Yeah, I would agree. You can be in the lab and you might encounter a problem and you want to think about it and you can just walk outside, take a walk on the campus. And there are a couple of places where you can just go sit on a bench and eat. All you would see in the distance are these huge mountains in the north part of BC. Yeah, and then solutions come, yes? <laughs> you, hopefully, <laughs> yes. Uh, at least, yeah, eventually eventually, solutions come, I would have to say that, yes. Yeah, yeah, very good, very good. So can you tell our listeners about your background? How did you become a biomedical engineer? Is this something you wanted to become when you were growing up or you had different aspirations? Yeah, I think when I was, my first kind of memories of wanting to become something, I would say that was wanting to be kind of like a biologist, zoologist, something like to do with animals. That was like the first memory that I have of wanting to be something when I grow up. And that had to do with me watching TV shows with like nature related, like a TV show about animals. And usually there would be one person that's the host of the show. And I had the impression that that person was a zoologist themselves. And often they are uh, like David Attenborough, that kind of like a... Um, I guess it's a public-facing zoologist or, or a biologist and a scientist. That was fascinating to me, just the job to be able to, that kind of job. Of, but throughout my childhood, I was very much interested in other branches of mostly natural sciences. Growing up, definitely, I enjoy solving mathematical problems, solving like logical problems, like developing a, a logical sequence of events and building an understanding of what's going on. So uh, patterns. So that's, I would say in, in some way, there is a connection there between definitely, I mean, biology, nature, and other branches like mathematics and physics. In elementary school and high school, I was still equally interested in all of these subjects. But I would say that as the time went on, I was, let's say, more interested in mathematics and physics and less in biology. And then even at some point, more in mathematics than physics itself. And this had to do with just kind of my impression of what that subject was at the time, depending on which part of mathematics, which part of physics, which part of biology we were learning. But uh, those things were always interesting, some parts more than others. And high school, I kind of really started to develop an interest in kind of the biology of the human body, the anatomy, the medicine. And when I was deciding on what I wanted to do for my university, I was conflicted between either kind of some kind of engineering and also medicine on the other side. And ultimately, I learned that there is a thing called biomedical engineering at the school that I was planning to apply for. And once I saw that as an option, I made a decision in high school, I want to say third, uh, so sorry, that's grade 11, but in Serbia, where I finished high school, uh, we reset the number of grades once we joined high school. So after grade eight, it's then grade one of high school to three. So in grade three of high school or grade 11, I became aware of this combination of medicine and engineering, primarily like electrical engineering. And without knowing exactly what it was, but the idea of it being exciting, I pursued that option. I prepared for my entrance exam for that School of Electrical Engineering in Belgrade, again in Serbia. That's where I finished my undergraduate studies. So I applied and then later learned more and more of what biomedical engineering is, the branches that it's, uh, that it's in itself huge. It has grown since, even since then, in the last you know five to ten years, it has grown as a field, and there's a lot more subfields within the field of biomedical engineering. But uh, long story short, is that I like to say that my logical thinking and in general, like very large interest in mathematics, and then later developed interest in medicine, is what led me to look for something that would combine them, 
And then once I found biomedical engineering, uh, that's what led me to pursue it. Very good. And then you pursued a project with the brain-computer interfaces. How did it happen? How did you get into that part of biomedical engineering? Yeah, going through undergraduate studies, I would say that most of my biomedical engineering courses came in third and fourth year of my undergraduate studies. The first two years were quite general electrical engineering, fundamental knowledge, and even mathematics, physics. So one of the first courses, the one of the ones that I definitely remember the most is a third year course that's called Electrophysiological Signals and Systems. So signals and systems in the human body. And that's where we learn about, well, first, of, let's say, talk about signals like ECG, electrocardiograph, EMG, electromyography, like activity of the muscles, and ultimately even EEG, uh, which is the most complicated of those three. It's the one that has the most complicated patterns to be kind of noticed, I would say. And even looking at some of the graphs of EEG signals is quite overwhelming if you're looking at 20 channels all at once and they are in a time domain where it's hard to distinguish what's going on. But definitely that's the one of those signals that, let's say, we understand the least. And there's a lot more to be understood about those signals. Even for my final undergraduate thesis project, I did some work with EEG signals. So when I joined Dr. Milos Popovich's group in University of Toronto, where I did my PhD, and working with my other supervisor, Dr. Cesar Marquez Chen, I talked to them about the different work that I would be interested in and the different work that was, uh, I was learning about the different work that they were doing already in the lab, the project that they were interested in pursuing and questions they were interested in answering and Right from the get-go, we started talking about EEG signals. The most common brain-computer interface applications today are based on EEG signals. So uh, when we were talking about EEG signals and their application, PTI wasn't far away from that conversation. And there were ways in which we wanted to, in our group, improve functional electrostimulation therapy, which was already extensively being researched on in this group. So this group has already worked with functional simulation for over 10 years at that point, almost 20. And we were looking for ways to potentially improve it because there were individuals who were participating in functional simulation studies who were not benefiting from that therapy, from that intervention. And also there were some who were benefiting. So we were looking for ways to how to address this gap that there were individuals who were not benefiting from it and trying to basically improve upon FES therapy. What can we do differently about it so that we can help the people who also, like the, the subtle group of people who are not benefiting from FES therapy? And that's where brain computer interface came in. Yes, and you had certain hypotheses, yes, behind that. Why did those people not respond to the stimulation? So what was it, and how did you start testing your hypothesis? The overarching hypothesis was that by adding brain computer interface, we can kind of do two things at least. We can get some insight of what's going on in the brain during therapy, and we can also use that insight like we can use some of that information that we have to now build intervention that would engage the brain. And another kind of mechanism that we were guided by. So I have to say that in this project, we were more driven from the perspective of building an intervention that is practical and feasible. There was already in the literature, there was work that was done before our group has done showing that BCI, first of all, is helpful for rehabilitation on its own in different ways. And uh, also that there was work that combined brain-computer interface and electrical stimulation. So what we were trying to do is we had a kind of a system of electrical stimulation therapy or a method that we were doing in the lab. We were looking to combine that with brain-computer interface. 
So we were inspired by the previous work that, that did this. And the hypothesis there, overall, the mechanism that was guiding this work, and even to these days, it still is, it's, is the ability to not just provide, a, so FES, like functional simulation, provides assistance for somebody to complete a movement. And that completion of the movement through muscle spindles, through other sensory organs, there is sensory information that is being sent to the brain upon completing a movement. It's kind of like how we are aware of how much we want to stretch our arm or as we are stretching forward or reaching forward and wanting to grab a water bottle, we get feedback. We don't want to, or like, let's say a, a very thin glass we don't use as much force to grab that as if it was a ceramic thick mug. And that is the sensory information that we get back to the nervous system to modify and modulate our movement. For people who experience stroke or spinal injury who are unable to perform a movement, they are also unable to get that feedback, sensory information. So you can say in, in a way over time that those neural pathways that, that send back the sensory information, they are used less. And with functional electrical stimulation, we definitely know that when muscle is stimulated and movement is completed, there is activation also of those neurons, sensory neurons that send the information back. So when a muscle, let's say when a tricep muscle is stimulated, the person's elbow will be extended. And there is a sensor in that joint that is noticing that and that information is sending back to the brain. That's the sensory side of the story. And with brain-computer interface, work that was done before hours and the work that continues today is adding also the confirmation that there is a command basically generated from the central nervous system that is being, that would normally be sent down, like a voluntary intention to, for me to reach forward and grab a water bottle, grab a, a cup of coffee, there's that signal, a voluntary motor command is being generated and sent downward towards the periphery from the central nervous system towards the periphery and being sent. And in that way, in a healthy nervous system, there's that command being generated and an execution of movement. So with functional stimulation, we are assisting with periphery, movement on the periphery, and getting the sensor information back but by the addition of the brain-computer interface, we are now also assisting with creating an alternative pathway for that voluntary motor command that is generated in central nervous system to be sent downward to the periphery. So by adding the brain-computer interface, now we are completing this loop and we are adding also the artificial voluntary motor command. Mm -hmm. And who are your patients that you are working with? I work with two types of patients or like two conditions. One was stroke population, so people who have had a stroke. And in our studies, we worked with two individuals who have experienced stroke many years before they started the study. So that was chronic stroke. So it was several years in the past that they experienced stroke, and now they are joining the study. They are undergoing this intervention. So that's where the description of chronic stroke refers to. And another population that I worked with throughout my doctoral studies were the individuals who experienced spinal cord injury. And for that, I worked in two studies. In one study, there were individuals who were at a subacute stage of spinal cord injury rehabilitation. What it means is that the spinal cord injury happened six months prior to them starting the study. So it was a recent injury. They, it wasn't a days old injury. It wasn't acute. That's why I'm calling it subacute. But these individuals are still actually in the hospital. And this was done at Toronto Rehabilitation Institute, Linhar Center. There were five individuals in one of our studies who were still staying in the hospital and also joining our study. And there was also another study where there were three individuals who had chronic spinal cord injury. That, again, is similar to chronic stroke. The injuries happened 
couple of years before these uh, individuals joined our study. So it's stroke is found in populations. Okay, thank you. I'm sure that they are receiving the conventional rehabilitation therapies, so physical therapies, yes, occupational therapies are probably working with them. So why do we want to add that additional component, the technology-based rehabilitation? What advantages can it give to us? Yeah, that's a great question because that's exactly what's going on, especially as these uh, patients are in their subacute stage of rehabilitation, they are in the hospital, they daily receive some treatment along the lines of conventional physical therapy or occupational therapy. Physical therapy on one side would help them attempt to regain function. And from my understanding of occupational therapy, it would help them to use the most of the function that they already have. They would just make adjustments in their environment. They would make adjustments in some of the assistive technology that they can use to make the most of the functions that they have retained after injury. So the reason why I believe technology has been introducing rehabilitation is to, like everywhere else, increase efficiency of any tasks that we are doing over time. So it, what we have learned about physical therapy and this kind of approach to recovery, or like in general, like recovery of motor functions of movement, of let's say arm and hand movement, which is the work that I did, it's that repetition is very important and doing things many times, doing things often, so frequency, uh, the intensity at which we are able to do things is also important, kind of increasing that intensity gradually. I would say very similar to how somebody goes about building a new skill. So if somebody's training to be a better golf player, they need to practice performing that motion, that movement of, uh, let's say, swinging a golf ball. And there are, right, there are different types of swings that you can do and you need to practice each one. And, and you only get good at golf if you practice all, all of them a lot and over time and you acquire those skills. And at some point, they become almost like your body has learned it and you are automatically able to do it without much deliberate planning and thinking. The way that I think about the recovery of movement is like relearning the movement. Even though the person knew how to move before the injury, the injury has resulted in them not being able to access those, like the circuits of the nervous system that are responsible for movement they are now damaged and they need to start from scratch to relearn this movement. And sometimes that damage is small and that process of relearning or recovery of movement is short and in a short amount of time and it would not require that much intensity and that much work. But sometimes the damage is large and the work required to regain that movement is hard. It takes a very long time. And that means it requires a lot of hours spent on it, a lot of repetitions. So that's one thing. But this, this is all under the assumption that a person can practice movement. So people can learn how to play golf because they already have the ability to move their arms and they just now need to move them in that way versus the other way. Like they need to learn how to move, but they already have the capacity to move. And for people who experience spinal cord injury, it's not just that they have forgotten how to learn, but the damage to the nervous system is so high, they're unable to do it. So how can you practice something when you are unable to do it? How can you practice golf swings if your arms are tied with a rope to your body? You can't. The first thing that you need to do is remove that rope, enable the movement. That's where functional stimulation came in when it was really developed and used for the first time, there were people who were unable to practice movement and move. Now they were able to do it because of electrical stimulation therapy. Initially, electrical functional stimulation was used more as a prosthetic device to just facilitate movement on a daily basis. But then it was one of the findings of people who were using FES uh, functional stimulation 
as an assistive device that they saw that their motor function without the assistive device was improving. The technology here was necessary in the first place to enable people who were unable to practice movement to now be able to practice movement. And that was the first reason why technology was introduced. Then the second is we can also introduce technology to increase the number of movement a person can do, right? Or if a therapist is there to offload some of the work that the therapist has to do manually with technology. So the technology is there to enable things that were not possible before and to improve efficiency, both on the side of the patient, what the patient is doing, but also to help the therapist. And that's where I see technology playing a role in rehabilitation. Yes, absolutely. And I liked what you say, to make something that wasn't possible, possible, which is in line with our podcast. Yes. yes. On your career, so making the impossible possible. So wonderful. Thank you so much for this explanation. And your next step was to propose this PCI FES system. And the project has a name as Kite BCI. Yeah. What was different in this project that wasn't done before in other studies? Because as you mentioned, there were already some studies that uh, utilized FES and combined it with BCI. So what was special in your project? Yeah, so as I mentioned, our group has worked with functional stimulation for years. And primary, and then Already from the onset, it was primarily used as functional stimulation technology to assist therapy. So our group has already developed functional stimulation therapy. There were other groups who also developed them around the same time. Distinguished our group from other groups in that domain is, well, first it was the ability to do larger studies, the number of participants that were available number of patients that were able to participate in these studies and do really long studies. So given the previous studies with functional stimulation therapy, there were uh, studies that were done uh, where the intervention was 40 sessions, 40 hours of therapy. And this is what I meant earlier. It takes a lot of time for the recovery to take place. It takes a lot of repetition of movement. So we had that in the lab, in this research group. We had that, let's say, let's call it like a long functional stimulation therapy, long intervention. And there were studies done by a group that were looking at the effects of this FES therapy in stroke and spinal injury population. As I mentioned, there were individuals who were not benefiting. Even though what we were doing was benefiting over 50% of people that were taking place, participating in the studies, we also saw, you know, one person here in this study or a couple of people in this study. So we were noticing these gaps. And this FES therapy was done so that it can address the needs of multiple different patients. So some patients would need work and require working on their reaching movement and some on the grasping movement, so fine motor tasks. And the technology itself that was used in those earlier functional stimulation therapy studies was built by my supervisor and some of his other colleagues before. And we were able to spend quite a bit of time of really finally developing protocols for FS therapy that can help us achieve five motor tests. So like grabbing a water bottle requires this kind of grasping motion, right? Which we would call a Palmer grasp. Right. And that requires stimulating certain muscles on the forearm that will be different than if there is like a pinch grasp. We just use this and grabbing like a pen, pen, pencil or a pen or even, uh, I don't know, a marble, marble, something small. And that would require a different kind of FES protocol because it would require stimulation of different kinds of muscles on the forearm. And then opening the hand in addition to that. So the, there was already the technology, FES technology that we had in the lab that was used to develop many different protocols of FES therapy for practicing different kinds of movements. And it was kind of all 
built together and assembled so it can be used in a clinical setting with the therapist actually using the FTS device without a need for an engineer there. That was kind of like already in place when I joined the lab. And as I was joining the lab, we just started work on brain computer interface. There was already an initial system in place built by my co-supervisor, PhD, one of my PhD supervisors, Dr. Marquez Chin. So there was a city in place that was now looking at ways of how we can build upon the existing FES therapy intervention, where the therapist knew how to use the FES therapy and it was nicely integrated with the rehabilitation approach and the, the system, and it can be used in a clinical setting. So what we were looking at was building a brain computer interface device that can be just added to that system that we already had in place. And that gave us some constraints on how our system needed to be different from other systems. So what that meant is we wanted our BCI system to respond to kind of a general movement intention rather than a specific movement intention. So we wouldn't train our BCI to respond to just uh, let you can open the BCI or you can turn on the simulation by thinking about the left hand movement and you can turn off the stimulation by right hand movement. That wasn't our goal. That was done before. But our goal was to just have it respond to any given movement that the therapist would tell the patient to do during therapy to attempt. So that was one of the constraints, right? And another th constraint was that we wanted it to be easy to set up. So our therapy sessions are approximately one hour long because that's the amount of time that the therapist would have available and also the patients would have available to the session. And we wanted most of that one hour time slot to be used for therapy rather than for setting up the system. And already the BCI, sorry, the FES, the electrical stimulation, requires some setup. It requires taking the, the sticky electrodes, putting them where they're supposed to be placed, and testing the amplitude of simulation. So there was another constraint. We wanted our BCI system to be set up quickly and ideally in as much time as it takes to set up FES system. Similarly, we didn't want to calibrate the system at the beginning of every session because that would also take some time. And we wanted it to be kind of compatible with how the therapist was already doing the FES therapy. Now, with the addition of BCI, we'll have to introduce some changes, but we wanted to make the experience also similar for the therapist relative to how they did regular FES therapy. So now BCI FES therapy, we want it to be similar. So all of those things contributed to how our system was unique, turned out to be unique, as we already were combining it with, with somewhat unique FES therapy approach that existed. And I mean, that led to then for the decision. So that led us to adopt a single calibration session. First of all, that led us to adopt that we wanted our brain computer interface to detect movement intention through electrophysiological signal that's called or a pattern, electrophysiological pattern in a brain activity that's called event related desynchronization, which is present with every executed movement or attempted movement or imagined movement. It can be recorded over the primary motor cortex most often and sometimes premotor cortex or supplementary motor area. But ultimately, it's, it's characterized by the decrease in relative power of the EEG signal in a specific frequency band because that allowed us to use the BCI with any kind of attempted movement because this pattern is present with movement in general, regardless of whether it's a reaching or grasping movement. So single calibration session, single channel that gave us a short setup. And we introduced some other things in terms of how the BCI is. So the BCI is running continuously. So we didn't want some hiccups in terms of when the simulation is turned on or off. So we introduced this kind of two states of the BCI. And ultimately, we connected all of that with a manual switch that was given to the therapist who can now, using that switch, change the states of the BCI 
and as a safety measure, override the VCI when the VCI is not responding as a fail-safe measure so that the therapy always continues. So the priority in our system was the therapy and the system needed to support the therapy rather than the therapy should be built around the system. So that was our motivation. That was our guiding principle. We wanted our system to fit into the existing therapy mode and make the experience very similar for the therapist as the one they had before already. Yeah. It shows that you really used all the strengths of rehabilitation therapy that was already built before, yes, in, in the group, which is essential. So you were going from therapy to designing something to just mm-hmm. enhance that therapy, to support that therapy. So it uh, uh, integrates yes. it into yeah. already existing. Yes, and it is a very unique approach, definitely FES for facilitating different types of movements, which usually FES is fairly simple, just one movement. You have variety of different protocols, yes, but all of them you can still integrate uh, the BCI in yes. uh, because you are using the event-related desynchronization. Beautiful, yes. And uh, as far as I know, your setup is really very minimalistic. You have only one EG electrode, if I'm correct. So it's very simple. Yeah, we have one channel. We have one EG channel, but that technically requires three electrodes because we electrodes around the ears. As a reference in the ground, I measured myself setting that system up and just the electrodes, because it's also like cleaning, right? There's some preparation to make sure that connection is good. Just that part is like maybe five minutes uh, and then connecting everything else. It ends up being around 10 minutes with practice. I was able to get it under 10 minutes in some experiments, but some experiments it would be 12 13, 15 minutes, uh, but our average was around 10, 11 minutes, which is what we reported in the paper. Yeah, which is wonderful. Yes, to be clear, one active electrode, one reference, and one ground. Yes, so yes. Um, three electrodes total. Yeah. Very good. And what inspired you to submit this project for the BCI Award? Everything that I just shared is the same kind of motivation and inspiration to submit this project. We wanted to also show how proud we were of what we have built, focusing not on the technical side, not on the technical achievements of the BCI. And we are very excited about the work that comes from other groups when they were able to, let's say, detect writing through the BCI. So through the BCI signals, they were able to recreate a written word. And that way, BCI would help with communication. That requires a very complex system, uh, working with a lot more channels and and a lot more data than ours. But we wanted to show in a clinical, practical application, we might not need that much. We can work with simpler systems that just need to work well enough so that the patient is receiving assistance from the FES therapy and stimulated by the simple BCI. And that over time, with 40 sessions, sometimes even with 20 sessions, they can see improvement in their function. So we were aware that the BCI award was not just for the technical achievement with the BCI, but also the achievements on the user interface. And that user interface as brain-computer interface, how can we make that brain-computer interface simpler, more practical for a clinical application, but also acknowledging that there are other people involved in therapy. There is not just the patient and the engineer. There is also the therapist. So how can also this uh, system, the brain computer interface system, work both for the patient and the therapist who is using this technology to ultimately help the patient during therapy? So all these reasons why I said how our system was unique, that's, that's the same motivation behind our submission of our Kite BCI system for the BCI award because we wanted to share our findings with the BCI award group and BCI community. We can continue to make improvements in this domain 
by solving not just the technical problems, but solving the problems in the domain of, let's say, cost-effectiveness, using friendliness, accessibility, and making a system that builds upon existing work that we have built already, existing knowledge. That was the motivation. We thought we were able to provide a unique perspective of using our BCI technology for over 300 hours with patients and therapists. And that's another thing. Uh, what was unique to our case. The fact that it was used by many people for a long time. Yes, absolutely. And I'm so glad that you are noting that the system doesn't need to be technically complex. It can be a simple system, but really which solves the current problem the usability of brain-computer interfaces, yes, because that's its application, because right now it's the main problem which was going on for a number of years, because BCI existed already for quite a few years, but the problem was that it wasn't really applicable, yes, Mm -hmm. the, the application wasn't really developed that well. And you proposed and focused on specifically applying it and integrating into existing therapy. Also, second thing that you noted is uniqueness. So each of people that might be considering a submission for BCI work, they all come from different laboratories, from different centers, different backgrounds, and each of those backgrounds is unique. So to combine this uniqueness with some idea that can help application, can improve applicability of brain-computer interfaces, help people, all that is valuable. I definitely would encourage people to think about this and apply for BCI Award and remember that even simple system, but which is unique, is valuable and definitely can become uh, nominated for the award and, um, and win the award in the same way. Exactly, yeah. I want to reiterate what you just said about encouraging people to apply. It's a great experience to also really work on distilling your idea to its most critical parts. And that's where you can find uniqueness is when you need to really narrow it down and let's describe it in a two-minute video or 300 words. You don't need to talk about things that are established in the BTCI literature. We know that there is already many ways in which we can build brain computer interfaces, but the problem of making it accessible is still a big one and not fully solved. And in that way, that's where many projects can be unique and continue to be unique in really trying to solve this problem of accessibility. Thank you so much. And what would be your advice for those who are already considering to submit their project? Maybe something that you learned throughout the process that you can advise people or, you know, give some suggestions. I definitely enjoyed my experience applying for it for those reasons that I just said. Also, I like that the award requires a video submission. I do know that some submissions have been the videos were done really well almost like i mean not almost but it seems like very professionally like a company making a submission but i think there is a uniqueness and you can get really creative with submitting a video even if you don't have professional team of video editors working with you on that project similar how like smaller Budget movies can send a really strong message and, and make a really good, entertaining cinematic experience without using the budget of the blockbuster movies. I would say just that on its own is a single reason why people should pursue applying for this award because it will force you to be creative in sharing your work in two minutes in a video format, which is not an easy thing to do, but can be very exciting because of the you know, ability to be creative. It's a good practice overall to, for communication. And anybody who has even like a small tinder or kernel of art, artistic tendency in, you know, in their approach, and I believe every one of us has that, this is a chance to do it. You know, in a PhD, you, you don't always get these chances. So my advice is to apply 
because just the fact of preparing this application is very valuable. You don't often get a requirement to submit a video with your application. Usually grant applications are in text. And actually, it could be a good practice for people. That's and yeah, that's something that I could share as an advice related to that. It could be a good practice for people who might want to pursue entrepreneurship. Because once I went over to the entrepreneurship side, very often there was a video part to an application. So even applying to incubators like uh, Y Combinator requires you to kind of talk to a camera for one minute about your idea, about yourself. So getting better at that can be helpful in for various ways and especially in the domains that might be outside of academia because academia is still so much reliant on text. Thank you so much for this advice. It's really helpful and it brings us to another part of what you do. It's entrepreneurship. So can you tell us about your entrepreneurial journey and uh, about your uh, work that you are doing right now in this domain? Of course. That's another thing. It's kind of like entrepreneurship. When I first heard of that word is one word explaining so much. And similar to biomedical engineering, there are so many kind of subcategories in that space. But I mean, yeah, entrepreneurship ultimately is kind of, uh, by being an entrepreneur, you are bringing ideas into reality. And usually those are definitely new ideas, building new products, building new services, solving a problem for a customer is how I see it. So in this case, you who are trained to think about what kind of problems your potential customers are experiencing and solving their problem. Well, I would say in academia, I mean, you have, of course, you identify a real world problem and you make a solution for it, but maybe problems that you're solving are so kind of, I would say advanced that you may not be able to get to the final solution just yet. You're making one step forward towards the ultimate final solution. But the entrepreneurship is where final solutions matter and count, and that's where they come to be realized. It's kind of like through entrepreneurship, you might be using research to inform your decisions. And like your, of course, products are based on research, but there will often be a reason that is right now ready to be used by people. Or you have found a way for people to use that research right now. Anyway, what I wanted to say is with entrepreneurship, I was just curious about that concept of bringing ideas into reality. And I used the period during my PhD to get informed by it. I informed about it. I mean, informed about entrepreneurship, how one person can do it, what are the first steps. And for me, one of the first steps was just looking up resources, entrepreneurship resources at my university. and. That's what any student can do because almost any university today has a form of uh, entrepreneurship resources, either through libraries or some sort of co-curricular activities. At the University of Toronto, that was done through library and also their own entrepreneurship center. And I have noticed a trend of many universities kind of opening innovation entrepreneurship center for cl with classes for students that are outside of their regular classes. So... I, I believe there are many ways today to, to learn about it. That's a great first step. It was a great first step for me. When I was finishing my PhD, I wanted to stay in Toronto for a period of time. I, I wasn't ready to, at that moment, move somewhere else. I wasn't at that time applying for postdoctoral fellowship positions in different parts of the world. I also didn't want to jump into a postdoctoral fellowship position right away, right after my PhD. So an opportunity that, that showed up for me was uh, Entrepreneur First program that was uh, running in Toronto. So it's, it's uh, in a way an accelerator, uh, but more than accelerator, they like to refer to themselves as talent investors. So what they do is they create this environment where people can apply to join an Entrepreneur First program and, or a cohort. And when you join a cohort, you are surrounded by, in my case, there was around seven, almost 80 people, like 70 people who were part of the program. And everybody there wanted to experience entrepreneurship, wanted to become an entrepreneur. And 
we were uh, brought together, approximately one half of us being technical founders, so somebody with domain expertise, like what they would call an edge in having an edge in, in a certain domain because of knowledge, because of experience, and also people who have experience of business development. So finding a market, finding a way to introduce a, program, a product to the market, so building a go-to-market strategy, having pathways of getting information from customers, potential customers, future customers, on what they need, what's their problem, how we are able to, the technical, let, let's say technical founder might have ideas of how we can solve certain problems, but which problems we are solving might come from the business development founder because they are talking to the potential future customers. Anyway, my story was that I joined the Entrepreneur First program and it was, it was really fun. It was a very different environment from my PhD, but still fast-paced, a lot of work, a lot of learning, learning many new things. And I, again, it's something I would recommend to people because you learn a lot in a short amount of time. And that's always an amazing experience where you can find that. The environment was really fun. A lot of interesting people to talk to, learn from them. And that's how I started working on Summation. So during, during Entrepreneur First program, I met my co-founder there in the same program. And she had experience of well, the publishing industry and providing writing services for businesses. And my background in being in academia, working with academic papers, of course, writing academic papers, reading them, but also realizing that not many undergraduate students were interacting with research papers while graduate students interact with research papers. We had a hunch that we could build a platform that can make research knowledge more accessible. And that was our initial direction in which we started going and building summations. Uh, thank you very much for sharing this experience. So can you tell us more where you are now in summations and how does it help people? So that was, as I mentioned, initial idea. But after talking to students, but also talking to professors of how we can help them bring summations to their students in their classrooms, we realized that we wanted to build a tool for educators, so for professors, that ultimately, of course, is for students as well. So it's for kind of all parties involved in education. So like the main North Star idea of making research knowledge more accessible has not changed, but the detail has changed for us. And we are now in the process of realizing this vision for summations as an educational platform that on one side, it helps professors build courses by using research papers as course material. And on the other side, we help students interact with that research, uh, with those research articles that are using materials in courses and help professors, help students to build up understanding of this material that is being used in courses and facilitate the development of uh, scientific literacy, critical thinking, assessing literature, like analyzing a paper, and then taking the next step of what are the the questions that we need to ask further to to really have a better understanding of what was conducted in the research. And in that sense, that's kind of what we are right now building so that professors can use it hopefully by the end of this year. So we have had professors use it here and there, more for us to get initial feedback, but we have gathered enough feedback now that we are building summations in that direction. So right now we are still in the development mode, I would say. People can go to our website and make an account and use it because we wanted to keep that channel of feedback open for anybody who is on our website, uses it, they, they can let us know what they think. But in the meantime, we are building it as an educational teaching and learning platform. Thank you. And I wish you all possible success with the development of summations and this platform. I, I'm, I'm myself very curious to check it out and to see what, what it is and how it will develop. 
Uh, what was the most challenging part of your career development? You know, through all this path, and you uh, were developing device, you were developing summation. So there was a lot, a lot here that you were dealing with. What was the most challenging part, and how did you solve that challenge? For me, the biggest challenge is definitely so the kind of the amount of work that I put on my plate to take on different projects and the different domains in each project. And then I definitely want to work as fast as possible to solve them and move forward. But I might put myself too much in the work direction and not take care of other parts of my life that are necessary for me to to continue to work and stay productive and kind of like basically avoid burnout. It's something that is a challenge and it's something that I'm still working on right now. It's a work in progress in terms of the like uh, details related uh, challenges. It was definitely really hard to do a uh, kind of hours that we did for data collection in our BCI project with a system that was that we just built and it was troubleshooting from time to time if some parts weren't working as well as we hoped for and having to do that very quickly because we needed to continue data collection. So it's kind of like dealing with challenges as they arise and they were not necessarily predicted and dealing with that always with the time pressure to address them because uh, they need to be addressed for the project to continue. And I would say similarly in entrepreneurship, it's always you're working on things that you have planned for, but very often you have to quickly work on things that you didn't plan for uh, to address something that you didn't think of. And it's necessary now for, let's say, in entrepreneurship, it will be for a user experience to be as good as you want it to be. You were thinking about different things, but then you might have missed something and you only realize this once the product is out, once people are using it. Same thing for BCI. Like you only realize certain problems once it's being used during therapy. And those are often hard things because they are stressful, because there is time pressure to them. But it is part of this journey. And while they are hard, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do them. It's it's definitely part of the journey, but as they accumulate, it's sometimes, and as you have many projects that have these components of things that can happen that are unpredictable, and there can be a lot of them very often, that's where I'm saying it's it's hard to sometimes manage work and other activities, because if you have many projects that have these aspects of kind of fires popping up and you need to put them out, that can accumulate and it can be exhausting and then we need to look for ways of how to manage that so that's why i'm saying it's a work in progress everybody will find different ways to address these concerns but it is the hardest part of having to do a phd or a research project or an entrepreneurship anywhere we're really kind of pushing yourself to the limits and pushing the knowledge of what is known to the limits or like Whenever you're doing something new and you do something new in research or in entrepreneurship uh, where there's not clear instructions of how things are done, you will encounter with these problems that you were not able to predict. And having many of those problems come up one after another can be exhausting. And the challenge is to stay energized so that you can take on more of those challenges. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I remember in our first podcast, our first Neuro Careers podcast, I talked to Dr. Christoph Guger from GTEC Medical Engineering. He said that it's important to choose whether you are working in academia or you are becoming an entrepreneur because it's very hard really to do both and the success rate is not as good if you are trying to split yourself in in both directions what do you think about that i agree with that statement i don't think it's sustainable for an entire life careers to be spent in both yeah i share the opinion that it's best to be in a long-term 
let's say, five, 10 year period be devoted to one of those th things. I mean, the reason why I'm doing it right now, it's I had the opportunity to pursue both and experience it for myself. And they are in some way connected as I am hoping to continue to publish and work on knowledge translation. And that way I can, it can form my decisions on what we can do better at summations. Uh, we want to partner with publishers, uh, partner with different groups who are doing knowledge translation. Or, of course, I mean, work with teachers. I would like to see if I can also teach myself a course during my postdoctoral fellowship. I don't know if that would be possible or something or something smaller where I would be able to, where I want to use summations in teaching the course, as it would be a great way to bring students in contact with research papers in an accessible and friendly way. So these two things that I'm working on right now are connected, even though the, it's a biomechanics project, but it's research as a bigger concept. And our uh, summations platform is there to to make research knowledge more accessible. I think in the long term, it's possible to also do them, I would say, in a, at a different scale than if you were to commit yourself, of course, to, to something. So depending how you're able to create impact, if you need to be hands-on to be most impactful, then probably it's much more impactful to devote yourself to one of those things, one of these two things full time. But if you can create impact being hands off most of the time and something's being hands on, I think it can be done. It, I would say it depends on what is required of you as in that position, uh, how you like to work, how you like to generate impact. Being hands on is always very exciting and fun. And that's what I'm doing right now. Being heads on in both domains, it's, I would say, not sustainable for a long period of time, but it's possible for some time to do it. Yeah, it's exciting. There's always something to do, and there's always problems to solve, and once the problems are solved, it's exciting. It's energizing. Absolutely. And speaking about uh, neurotech assist rehabilitation. What are the biggest problems right now in the field that need to be solved? There is, I would say I can classify them in two domains. One is understanding, building understanding of how exactly these interventions are affecting the central nervous system. We have hypotheses of mechanisms of FES therapy or BCI controlled FES therapy, but setting up studies to answer those questions specifically for the mechanisms to identify and then be able to, by understanding the mechanism, I think we'll be able to more effectively allocate resources to know whether, let's say, somebody can, because even today, conventional physical therapy is more accessible and it's Let's, let's call it less expensive than therapy that uses technology. And therapy with functional stimulation is also less expensive than the therapy with both electrical stimulation and brain computer interface. And then adding new technologies, adding new technologies, all of this adds costs. Because of the added costs, usually these therapies are only accessible in certain parts of the world, in certain centers. So even in Canada, they're only accessible. Not across Canada, but in a few places in Canada. So if we better understand the mechanisms, we can identify when to apply the therapy and to whom. So if we know that FES therapy will not work for somebody, but BCI FES therapy will work for that person, then we would now not do FES therapy and just straight up go to BCI FES therapy and find ways to financially enable that. And the second thing is to make it more accessible around the world, like at different places. So if let's say there is a therapy clinic in a rural area, there is one therapy clinic or multiple, most often they would do more conventional therapies and have less technology too. But even FES therapy is a good example of technology that it's much less expensive than robotic systems, for example, and it's lighter, it's easier for people to store them. So with training, people can easily add functional stimulation therapy 
to their clinics, even in rural areas, because it doesn't require a lot of space for storage. It doesn't require complex maintenance. It can be easily delivered there. So building accessible technology that can be replicated and used almost anywhere, not just in big urban clinical centers, then also building an understanding of how to pinpoint which of these options that we have at the table is best for a given individual. So it's like, I would say the two, still the two biggest problems are the understanding of the mechanisms which can inform making a decision how to treat an injury, not just an injury, but a specific case of an injury in a given individual, and then uh, making technology more accessible. And how I have to say more accessible both in price, so both in cost, but also in terms of complexity of how many people you need. Can anybody be trained to use the technology or can anybody trained in physiotherapy be also trained to use FES therapy uh, and so on? So it's accessibility and understanding of the mechanism. Thank you so much. And how do you see the field of neurotech assisted rehabilitation, let's say 50 years from now or maybe 100 years from now? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I am sometimes conflicted about, let's say, the impact of the impact of prosthetics, whether in the future, if that keeps progressing, whether it's better to replace an uh, impaired limb with something completely artificial that can be made well enough so that it can respond to our kind of instinctual voluntary movement. So if I want to reach for a cup with an artificial arm and hand, I just think about reaching for it instead of I think about moving a shoulder muscle to move the prosthetic limb. The the current prosthetics are not that intuitive, so it's not a really good solution. So my conflicting thoughts about the future are whether rehabilitation will be replaced or removed. The need for rehabilitation might be removed by either future prosthetic devices or future pharmaceutical interventions or something like uh, surgical interventions, basically medical interventions that can work to kind of uh, recover the system from the inside rather than from the outside. If I were to say that that kind of a replacement doesn't come, which again, I have no educated guesses in that domain, I think the direction of what Neuralink is doing, of being able to more precisely record signals from the human body is, I think, an advancement that can also affect uh, neurorehabilitation. Not necessarily with an invasive technique, because ultimately with neurorehabilitation, the way that I see it with rehabilitation, we do not need implantable devices for rehabilitation, because the goal is to help recover the system by doing things kind of externally, help the guide the system in recovering itself. So by doing BCA controlled FES therapy, we are helping the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system rebuild the pathways that facilitate movement. Yeah, I'm not very creative in this domain of how that might look like because there's many different ways in which the problem of impaired motor function can be resolved. And neurorehabilitation is one of the ways, but not the only way. Since there is progress happening on these other fields, I'm unsure how that might affect neurorehabilitation if if we're going to need it in 50 to 100 years. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very reasoning behind it. Because uh, as you said, we may not even need it. That's a good thinking that it's not the only way to answer questions or solve problems. Yes, you know, there are many other ways and we also need to take that into consideration. Very good. And the one question that I ask all of our podcast guests, and this is about making the impossible possible. So was there anything that maybe in the past you thought of as impossible that 
actually became possible as you were progressing through your career? What was that and what helped you to make the impossible possible? Both my PhD and my starting a company is not something that I was clearly seeing in my future when I was starting those things or like thinking about wanting to do something like that. But I would say that definitely actually publishing an academic paper, like where I was the first author, that definitely seemed like something, like when I started PhD, I knew I would probably, like I would probably need to do it, but I didn't see a way how that would be possible for me. I, I mean, unclear what I needed to do and just that I could write something that would go through peer review process and be accepted and be published. And it just seemed completely out of my world. It seemed like I wouldn't be able to do that. I might be able to kind of, I don't know, do some other things like be, be a co-author as it happened with the very first paper that happened. But it's me kind of leading the charge of publishing an academic paper and see it Definitely hard. Like in that way, not possible for me. Somebody else can be the leading author and I can support them. But I, me being the first author was something that seemed just like not in my future. And when I started working on my first paper, it took me a very long time. But what made it possible is having the right mentors around me to guide me. That's number one thing. Uh, the second thing is perseverance. And kind of working on the things that are in front of me. So let's say I wrote the first draft and I got feedback from my supervisors and there was a lot of feedback as it was the very first time I was writing an academic article. And the point was not to think now clearly, yeah, there's a lot of feedback. Clearly this was a man for me. I'm going to stop right here, right? Or like not even... Oh, there is so much feedback. I think I ended up kind of doing this. Like I saw all of the feedback and I was trying to just forget about what I saw. That there was a lot that I saw. And I just zoomed in on the first feedback and it was one thing, one problem. And I saw that one. It was in the Word, right? The Word document. And I removed it. So it wasn't there anymore. So I again zoomed in and just scrolled down to the next one and remove that one and in that time maybe even uh, two weeks later let's say maybe it took me two weeks to resolve all this feedback and i think it was multiple weeks i was done and there was a piece of writing that was better than before because of my mentor because of their feedback because of their guidance and it wasn't completed yet right i sent it got more feedback it got better it got improved same thing with submitting it to a journal, I got comments from the reviewers. And after this months long journey, I got to the point where I got an email saying that my paper is accepted and it will be published. And the lesson was to do that one small step at a time. And that's what makes, I believe, impossible possible because you cannot think about the whole task that's in front of you. It's a bit overwhelming, it's too large, but solving one smaller thing at a time, it adds up and the time goes by and you get more things done and things accumulate and ultimately you finish something that was seemingly impossible, but what was actually happening, you just needed more time. I think that's a great advice. And actually today I was recording another podcast with Dr. Nicholson, Jody Nicholson Bell from the University of North Florida. And she mentioned exactly the same thing to focus on one step at a time. So uh, I think I, I also agree that it is very, very important. Thank you. And for those who are listening to our podcast and they are considering pursuing a career in uh, neurotechnologies, what would be your main advice? I think, yeah, main advice is be comfortable with learning new things and be comfortable with moments of not knowing things. So when you have a realization, hey, I don't know what's actually going on here, be comfortable with that. It's not something that you should be ashamed of or like uncomfortable with that feeling. It's, it's, totally fine. it's a totally fine feeling. And don't kind of let it go to waste. 
bad feeling. It's okay to feel that, but it's kind of like a call to action, call to, to learn something. And that's where it's like being comfortable with learning new things and be comfortable to ask questions. So those things are necessary because there are so many unknowns in your technologies that you will quickly be able to catch up to the knowledge that we have, that we have generated up to to, to today and the theories that we have. But after that, it's uncharted territory and people might not have exact answers developed into a theory that's in a textbook. People have ideas. So that's why it's necessary to ask other people for their opinions or for their like ask questions because people have ideas and through those conversations you can learn so be open to learning new things and kind of comfortable with pursuing to learn and of course be comfortable yourself with not knowing things uh, because it's going to happen in this field i mean many other fields everything that we do today that we are pushing the limit of human knowledge to its barrier and then trying to make a dent there on the edge. Mm, it's necessary to be comfortable with not knowing things. Sometimes you learn things and, and then you might forget that you learned it, but that's okay. You learn it again. Or like you get reminded. Again, if you don't know, you are aware of that and you know you should be then okay to ask questions. And yeah, in that regard, I think it's, it's definitely a space where we are exploring new frontiers in your technologies, in neuroscience, and more than anything, you need to be comfortable with dealing with a lot of unknown things and figuring them out. And that's very exciting because then you, you're always learning new things and you might have already developed this part of yourself that's comfortable with that environment. And if you happen, then you can put yourself in those kinds of situations, listen to your kind of emotional response and see what you can do differently to get comfortable with these kinds of environments. And that's the advice because it's possible to build it, to build that comfort, but it will require a bit of self-reflection, examining how you feel in certain situations surround yourself with people who will be completely okay with you asking questions and and not knowing things always but it always requires you to do your work beforehand but then you will reach a limit and that's when it's okay to be comfortable with not knowing things and ask questions yeah thank you so much dr jovanovic if our listeners want to get in contact with you or learn more about the things you do how they can do it i have a personal website lazarjov.com l a z a r j o v.com that's the same as my twitter handle Laz, at @lazarjov on linkedin lazar jovanovic they can find me those kind of social media uh, platforms and my website are there to highlight my work. My publications are on Google Scholar, but uh, people can reach out to me through any of those platforms uh, for a conversation if they want to learn things in detail. As I mentioned, these social media platforms, my websites are there to highlight things and for me to share things I find fun and interesting and that I'm myself uh, curious about. Yeah, thank you so much. And we will add all that information into our podcast notes. And before we end our podcast, is there anything else you would like to say to our listeners, something to share or any advice you want to give? I would say being curious about the world. There are so many things that are fun and there are many aspects of newer technology that are fun and there are many aspects in other parts that are fun, and I find that they somehow all get connected. So what I like to do is, if you are, uh, if I'm doing something, I really like to kind of dive deep there. Even just for a moment, for half a day, if like I'm in the garden, I will, and I'm taking out weeds, I want to take them all out and, I don't know, do everything there. And if you immerse yourself in, in a thing, even like gardening or cooking, if you immerse yourself in anything, then I think you can get in like that flow state that people talk about, but 
you might draw some conclusions, some very weird uh, conclusions that uh, and insights that can be helpful in your neuroscience project. You never know, but I think the ability to kind of being immersed is conducive of good ideas, being immersed in, in an activity. What I like to do, and I try to do this by example, is I like to leave any place that I find be better than I found it. This is what I'm kind of hoping for myself, and it's sometimes hard to do, but that's why I'm saying it's I try to do this by example, by what I do, how I conduct myself. And let's say if I join a new lab, I I do try to keep it organized and uh, to keep the space clean, to make sure that the equipment that I use, somebody else can use after me. So these things I like to do by example. And I think it's a hard thing to do. It's an easy idea to leave a place better than you found it. And I think if all of us do it that way, then uh, our environment it will be really nice. Thank you so much. That's a, a great uh, example, um, a great uh, advice. And thank you very much for being with us today. Um, it was very insightful, very interesting. And uh, I wish you all possible success and in your studies and in your entrepreneurial journey. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Milena. It was a pleasure to talk to you today. Are you a fearless pioneer in the world of brain-computer interfaces? Do you have an amazing project that's pushing the boundaries of what's possible? Then we want to hear from you. The International BCI Award is one of the biggest and most prestigious awards in the BCI world. And the deadline for submission is September 1st. But don't worry. You don't need a top-notch budget or equipment to be a nominee or a winner. All it takes is a great idea and the determination to make the impossible possible. So, submit your project now at bci-award.com or find the link in our podcast notes and join us on this incredible journey to explore the world of BCIs. And make sure to listen to our upcoming BCI Award Neuro Careers podcast series for tips and tricks on creating a successful submission. Who knows? You might be the next nominee or winner of the International BCI Award and proudly showcase your nomination on your resume to impress potential employers and establish a successful career in neurotechnologies. But don't stop there. If you are looking for more guidance on succeeding in neuro careers, book a free consultation with me, your podcast host, Dr. K, at the Institute of Neuro Approaches. So, what are you waiting for? Let's make the impossible possible together.